little bit of a lengthy one. Um, so first of all, uh, I want to thank the Product Tank guys, DH, Sylvie, all the normal folks for inviting me today. I've always, similarly, I've always been on the other side. It's great to be on this side. I had a quick chat with Sylvie a long time ago and saying, maybe we could do something a little, more, a little bit more technical. So thanks for having me here. Thank you. Uh, hey, no more fluff. No more fluff. No more fluff. So I'm talking about slaying the API beast and I've got a very sexy deck slide here. Right? They say don't judge a presentation by its cover, but in this case I encourage you to. <laughs> because this is probably going to be the most exciting slide that you'll see for the rest of the half an hour. I also want to wish all of you a happy World Product Day, if I'm saying it right. First time I'm celebrating it. Um, it's the first time we celebrated, so it's my first time celebrating it. So happy Product Day to everyone here. So my name is Rizwan and I'm a Product Ninja. I've been a product guy for about 10 years now. I've been in different startups, primarily in fintech, right? So I've been hidden in the weeds for a while. I've moved into logistics even sexier, right? Uh, I, I, I'm known as uh, Papa Rizwan, or Product Papa in Ninja Van. Um, it just speaks to the youthfulness of the organization, not my age. Although I am married with kids, right? A little bit more about me. Um, I started in 2007. I was a noob. Uh, I was I was uh, in I was trained technically in computer engineering, right? But very early on, I realized something about myself. I wasn't a very good uh, developer, not as good as some of my peers. Uh, and I took some time to reflect, and I realized that I did have the gift of the gap. I could bullshit very well. Uh, so I decided to make product management my career. <laughs> So it's 11 years later, incredible, right? I'm, I'm, I'm an experienced noob now, right? I am now a leader in BS. I, have, uh, I, I, I basically lead a group of guys and I teach them the art of BS, right? I'm, I'm actually the product management director at Ninja. I've grown many ways, including my waistline and my weight. It's not very apparent to the picture, is it? But it's true. Um, there's this joke that's been floating around in my office. We had a little session and we were all laughing about uh, a, product manager, a product manager walks into a bar joke, right? This was another joke that we found. And we were laughing our heads off because we found it very funny. And then I went home, I reflected it in my shower and then I felt really sad. <laughs> yeah, because it's true. To a large extent it's true. Director of product managers are mostly entry level programmers, right? This is the best we can do. So most of you would say yes. I work with a very young, vivacious, hungry group of product managers in Ninja Van. Always eager and hungry to learn new things, right? And, and the brand that of, of product management that practice in Ninja Van is very technical. We have a small group of, of product managers with a, a very tight-knit group of engineers. We lean on them, we talk to them, we, we, we have stand-ups, we do the scrum, we do all that good stuff. We really depend on them to deliver our products for us. Right? And as product managers who are not technical, you sometimes struggle. Right? A young product manager came to me one day and says, Rizwan, I'm feeling like a little bit difficult because I feel like I'm really going against the grain with some of these developers. Right? We, he, he, he feels that he keeps saying, when can I have this? How difficult is it to be done? Why do you have to refactor it? Why can't you just add a button? How difficult can it be? And Asking these questions over and over, he felt that his relationship with engineering was eroding. So he asks me, you know, like, what can I do to kind of improve this? He in fact told me that he felt like a pest, right? And he could only go to a corner and sing Crimea River. So what could, advice could I provide this little young Padawan, right? Um, he wanted to know how he could work more closely and effectively with engineers and not always have his head bitten off. And I told him, look, all relationships are based on two things, trust and communication. So if you've got communication and you can speak technical communication, it's a huge bonus, especially if you have to work with engineers. I don't know how many of you have seen this uh, infographic inside the mind of a product manager. I love it because I think it's extremely accurate, right? 40% of our brains, all the product managers here, 
we should be very good in communication, or at least 40% of our effort in communication. Another 20% in engineering, 20% in design, and 20% in business acumen. So you've got the green bit covered, the communication, and you've got the orange bit covered, engineering, you're already at 60%. You're 60% of the way. In high school, 60% was my go-to grade. <laughs> so it's a good start, right? It's a good place to begin. There's this uh, quote, and Martin will be very excited to see this. I'm quoting him, right? <laughs> um, you know, being a product manager is all about stakeholder management. It's all about linking the various groups of people together, right? In order to do that, you've got to be able to speak to speak. You've got to be able to empathize. I was in a GA, speak last, uh, GA uh, General Assembly uh, uh, session last week called Inside the Minds of Brilliant Designers. My good friend over here, Norman Tay, was on the panel. And he covered tools for a CX individual, right? customer experience. And one of the things that he mentioned was a very important tool was the ability to basically spend time with people you don't normally spend time with, right? Understand what's in their head, understand what's valuable to them. And that's essentially what this is about. And that's essentially what product management is all about, right? We have capabilities in design, we have capabilities and knowledge in technology, and capabilities and knowledge in business. So today, this is my damn long introduction to my actual presentation, right? Today I'm gonna to talk about APIs. Why APIs? Because I feel in the line of work that we do, being able to speak API is almost being able to speak engineering. I'm going to try to cover some key things today. For those of you who have zero like, background into APIs at all, the five things that you've got to kind of understand about APIs to be able to get there. My hope is by the end of the day, you would have these fundamentals, be able to go back, do some research and reading on your own, and you're on your way there. Okay. I know the title of my presentation was Slaying the API Beast, but for those of you who thought I were really going to come out of here slaying the API Beast, that was event bait or click bait for you. <laughs> right. I'm going to be covering fundamentals. So quick question, how many of you know Karate Kid, the, the movie? Miyagi-san and Daniel LaRusso. The new one by Jack. The, the first one, the original one. Wax on, wax off. <laughs> who knows that? Oh, that's really sad. <laughs> that's really sad. So I wanted to say, today I'm going to teach you the wax on and wax off of APIs. And I realized that that should have been my presentation title. But now in retrospect, only less than half the room knows about this, so it's quite concerning. So please go home and torrent it or something. <laughs> okay. So jumping into the middle of the presentation, watching my time, what is an API? Formal definition, right? You can read it for yourselves. The layman way to define it is a stable contract for communications between computer services. Let me break this down for you. An API is basically a mechanism that allows computer services to speak to each other. Okay, Servers, computers, web services to speak to each other. As human beings, I can talk to you and say, pass me an apple, or throw me an apple, or throw me that red fruit on the, on the platter, or roll it to me, and you'd still understand because you've got this thing, this incredible brain that understands all this. But in the world of the internet, in the world of the web, you've got to be more direct and specific. APIs are basically communication contracts. APIs are not languages, APIs are architectures for communication. Okay? So this, every server has a different platform, every server uses a different language. We need to define it very specifically. A very common analogy used to define APIs is restaurants. I'm going to use the analogy right now. Very quickly, imagine that I'm a web service and the restaurant's a web service. I'm trying to get something. When you go to Google and you type in a search, you're essentially going to Google and getting something back from Google, essentially, right? But those servers are talking to each other. When I go to the restaurant, what do I look for? I need to be able to order what I want to order, but I can only order what the restaurant serves, which is how kind of the web servers work, right? I go there and I look for what's called a menu. A menu essentially is an API document, right? A menu tells me what's available. So I open it up and I go through it and I look at starters, mains, and I, and I see burgers and I, look, I see cheeseburger, great. So I'm gonna call the waiter. In my example, the waiter is the API, the menu is the API document. Slightly different from this diagram, right? I speak to the waiter and say, get me a burger. 
The waiter says, yes, sir, goes over to the kitchen, passes the message to the kitchen, and comes back to me and says, your burger is on the way, sir. And we've got a request response loop happening. That's a very good analogy of what an API is, simplified for everyone here. The problem, though, is that no two APIs are the same, right? So today, can I really give you a breakdown and, go, and, and you guys go home and pull out any API document and everything I've taught you applies? Unfortunately, the answer is no. But I can give you some basic building blocks that allows to get you halfway there. There's five elements you should care about. These are the five I mentioned about. A request, response, data, auth, and headers. Let's jump right in into request. So I mentioned this request response cycle. I'm going to speak in the world of the internet. Okay? APIs can be used in many different domains, many different areas, protocols. I'm going to use the HTTP protocol because most of us, I would imagine, are working with products that revolve around the internet. So let's keep it simple. Okay? So the basics are a client would send a request to the server and the server would return a response. Very simple a concept introduced here, request and response and client and server. When you make a request to the server, what are you actually sending, right? You're sending a request block, okay? And the request block has a very fixed structure. Remember I mentioned that APIs are contracts. They must have the required information in the formats that were defined by the API document, okay? So there are four things in a request block. Remember, request and response. Request is the first one. There are four items in a request block. I'm going to go through the first two, URL and method. What's a URL? A URL is me basically tell, telling the waiter that I want a cheeseburger in this manner, with a URL. So basically, protocol is HTTP, which is the internet's protocol. The host is maybe the, the restaurant's name. The port is, I won't explore, explain the port. The resource path is what, where to find what I want, the resource that I want. If you, if you go to Google Images and search for image, you're looking for images. The resource you want are images. But in my case, I'm looking for a cheeseburger. So when I open the, the menu, I'm looking at starters, mains, burgers, cheeseburgers. So likely, my path would be mains, burgers, cheeseburgers. OK? And what's my query? What's a query? Query is when may, maybe you've got many cheeseburgers, so you want to be very specific on which types of cheeseburgers you want. So I could put. Uh, sauce equals mayo and bun equals sesame, right? So that allows me to tell the API exactly what I want and, and this is the message that I need to be including in my little block when I pass this message to the waiter, okay? The next thing I want to cover is the methods. So in an API, when you send an API, you've got to also inform uh, the method that you're using. So there's many methods available, but the four most common ones, and I'm sure many of you have come across it, get, post, put, delete, right? Get basically is to get a response. Put is basically to create a, 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 basically a resource. Sorry, post to create a, a resource. Put is to amend or modify the resource. And delete is to basically remove or delete the resource, right? So imagine in that example I gave you whilst in the menu, or sorry, whilst at the, at the restaurant. Don't bother read all that. Right, I'm going to explain it to you. I'm at the restaurant. I sit down. I look through the menu. I've decided what I want to order. I do a post to the, to the, to the waiter. Starting to sound a bit abstract, right? I would like a cheeseburger, please. So I'm, I'm asking for a cheeseburger. They're going to make a cheeseburger for me. While the cheeseburger is being made, uh, I call the waiter because I have a change of mind. And I'm going to put a put request, put sesame seeds. Right? So the waiter hears me and goes to the kitchen, puts a, hears my put request, and comes back with a response, says, sir, we've added sesame seeds. Right? So I'm waiting, and I'm really hungry. I'm waiting for my dinner, and I keep calling the waiter, get my cheeseburger, get my cheeseburger, get my cheeseburger. And the waiter keeps coming back and says, it's not ready, it's not ready, it's not ready. And I get really frustrated, and I say, delete order. Right? And I, I leave the, the restaurant. Those are the four methods which I just mentioned, and how they would affect the resource based on the verb that was used, okay? I also mentioned that the waiter kept coming back to me and giving me a response. The way the res waiter gives me the response also has to be structured. Remember, we're in the internet world, computers talk to each other, it has to be very structured. 
for a response, this is, how the, this is how the structure looks like. What I want you to focus on is the status code. How many of you have gone to the internet, looked for something, and gotten a 404? I think that's the most common one. Everyone knows a 404, right? But in the internet protocol, there are many, many HTTP status codes. Okay, this is a critical piece because what I told you early on is that we need to be able to bridge the gap between product managers and developers. And developers often say, Rizwan, we've hit a 400 or 503. Right? Sounds like police codes, but they're actually uh, HTTP, code, HTTP codes, right? 503 is service unavailable. In the old days of Ninja Van and Zalora, Zalora would tell me, Rizwan, 503, we can't get our orders through. Right? We need to be able to understand this on a very high level so that we can be effective while speaking to our developers. If our developers have to explain this to us, it makes it a little bit more difficult. I'm going to skip the next section now, which is the body. Okay? Wow, you can't really see this, can you? It's very small. In my example I gave you, I went in the restaurant and I ordered one burger. What if I wanted to order a whole meal for my whole family? So two starters and five mains and three desserts and ten drinks and extra fries and stuff like that. Does it mean I need to make 20, 30 different calls? The answer is no. The answer is you can actually put the information in the body of the API call. Okay? So in this example, there are two types of languages which are commonly used with APIs, and they are JSON and XML. I'm sure everyone's heard of them. JavaScript, uh, object notation, and extensible markup language. I'm going to introduce to you again some critical elements about JSON and XML. Okay, this is the, these are, these are the, the languages commonly used, or formats commonly used, to define the body. Body is also known as payload. So when your developers say, can you check the payload, right? It means, can you check the body of the response or the body of the request, okay? I'm also going to, I'm going to show you this about, about JSON. JSONs, you can, you can identify them basically by the curly brackets and what's called a key value pair. The other thing that really crit critical to know about is you can't really see this here, but there's a square bracket right in the middle. So there's an array. I hope you guys know what's an array, right? Key value pairs can be individual, individual or can also have an array within them. This is an example of a very long JSON. The key value pairs have value strings, and you can see this is an array within the key value. Each, each item is also called an object. XML, on the other hand, looks kind of like HTML. You've got opening notes and closing notes, and you've got values in the middle, and they use nesting to define arrays. Okay? I'll show you why later on this is kind of important to know if this is something you're not familiar with. Next, I'm going to cover headers, okay? We're almost at the end now. How do you know, you know, some restaurants allow you to just come in, place the order, and kind of pay later. Some restaurants require you to put your credit card up front. If not, they're, going to not serve, they're not going to serve up your resource to you, right? So how do you know, how does a web service know that you're allowed to request for a resource from them? And this is where the concept of authentication comes in. Okay, in that API, in that request and response I spoke about, there's also an element of a header. And within the header, you can put in a lot of different things which allows you to facilitate the communication between the two parties. Two examples are authentication, and the next example is the language, right? There's many different types of authentication. I'm not going to dive into this today. It's a very deep and heavy topic, right? There's basic authentication, there's API key authentication, there's OAuth. And they all do basically the same thing. It allows a requester to basically prove his existence to the, the client, to prove his existence to the server. So the server can willingly and, and clearly provide that response accordingly. Another example is the language. So if you've got machines on the internet that speak different languages, and in this example, the client is only able to accept JSON, so you can include these headers in, uh, sorry, these values in your headers, right? The client tells the server that I, I can only accept JSON as a language, and the server will respond, and in its header, it will state that 
I've sent you a response. The body is in the format of JSON so that the requester knows how to kind of read the information. Okay? So that's done. Five key elements introduced to you very quickly over 10 minutes, I believe. Right? Request, response, data, auth, and headers. So what's really next? What I encourage you, all of you, to do is to go home and try these things, right? Try to identify the authentication methods, grab an API document, try to identify the auth methods, review all the endpoints made available, examine the body of each endpoint, and if there's a test API, try it out. Very quickly, what I did last night, yes? Is it time for questions? Not yet, almost, yeah. Very quickly, what I did last night is I pulled out the API document to point out some of these things for you to kind of actualize and realize what we've just learned, right? So if you open Shopify, and I encourage you to look at Shopify's API because it's one of the best written documents around. Uh, APIs are known to have really crappy documentation, but Shopify, Shopify has one of the most amazing. They must have a product team just for the API documentation, <laughs> right? When you open it up, the first thing you see is authentication, although you can't see anything here, right? I've extracted what it says here, and now when you read this message, you kind of know what I'm talking about, right? It kind of means that you've got to provide an X Shopify access token within a header when you make a request. How do you get that token in the first place? You've got to do this auth handshake. And click there to find out how you get your auth handshake. Right? Kind of makes a little bit more sense now. Zoom through the document, you go to the product page. And you can't really see this, but it says what you can do with product. Right? Now you can see the first thing, get, that's your method. And then you've got your URL, which is your resource allocation, right? Or your, your resource identifier. It says get admin products.json. What does that mean to all of you? Make a guess. Get all the products in your store. In what format? JSON format. Second one was get products count. Get all the product counts in your store. Suddenly you, you find when you look at documentation, you kind of make sense. As a product manager, how do I use this information? I'll get to that in a moment. You can open up each of those calls and look at the content now. So when you look at a very good API documentation, it has the methods, which is also known as the endpoints, and then it has sample responses. Okay? So when you open it up, you have a sample response. This is for get all products. Suddenly you see it's in JSON, curly brackets, square bracket. So if you read it downwards, this is a list of products, array of products. A product has an ID object, a title object, a body HTML, a vendor, a product type, da, 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 da. and then it's got a nested array in it as well. Right? You've got variances with a square bracket and further items as well. So suddenly scrolling through it doesn't seem as complicated anymore. One thing to take note though is for many API documentations, even though this is an array, they only show one instance. So it's not immediately obvious to you if you're not familiar with the usage of square brackets and curly brackets, that, that that's an actual array. Okay? The last thing you can do is, or one question someone would have is, okay, if API is a language that computers use to talk to each other, web services use to talk to each other, how am I as a product manager going to be testing APIs or trying it out? Your fourth step was encouraging me to go try it out. How do I try it out? Do I use terminal or command prompt? Uh, the answer is no. There are many other products out there that allows you to use uh, third-party tools that allows you to play around with APIs in a visual format with a UI. The most popular one is Postman. Okay? And this happens to be a screenshot from, again, the Shopify website. Shopify even lists down how to use their API on Postman, which is freaking amazing. Right? If you look at the interface of, of Postman, the common things appear again. The method, the URL, the body. I believe this is authentication, headers. It says here JSON, application JSON. Right? And then you've got your body. So all this doesn't become as scary anymore. Why is all this important to us as product managers? I mentioned the ultimate first and foremost, our goals is to be able to speak the speak of developers to be able to understand what they mean when they say, Rizwan, I think we need a new endpoint. It needs to be a get endpoint. It needs to point to a particular resource. It needs to return an array of items in its body. 
for you to be able to converse with your engineers on that level will bring you that much closer to Nirvana. Okay? <laughs> Secondly, APIs in themselves are products. So Shopify has a product manager who's in charge of the product. Ninja Van, unfortunately, we don't yet have a product manager that's in charge of our API. Uh, our engineers take care of that. But in many cases, we've heard, for example, uh, let me think of Trulio. Who's heard of Trulio? They have an API as a product. They monetize their product. They have product managers who treat that API as a product in itself. So that product manager needs to know how to read, eat, breathe, and, leave, uh, and live API, right? How to write these documentations, how to understand them, how to communicate, to, uh, communicate these documents to their users. Um, that's the second reason why we also need to get familiar with APIs, because APIs in themselves are products. Third reason, many of us work in organizations that deal with partnerships. Ninja partners with, you name it, Lazada, Zalora, Sephora, right? Yeah, Zalora. How do we integrate with them? APIs. I recently worked on an integration with Line in Thailand, and literally the only documentation was given to me was an API Line documentation. They gave me a flow and they gave me a documentation, and they said, let's integrate. So I had to spend a day looking through those, that documentation, understanding it, and then flying over to Bangkok, sitting with their engineers and product managers, and speaking Klingon. Right? <laughs> Basically speaking API. Right? We had to sit down and talk through APIs and understand them. Uh, organizations like that also speak API, even on the product manager level, even on the QA engineer level. Right? So it's important for us to get there. What I've given to you, hopefully, today, are the basic tools to get you started. There's so much more to APIs that you can kind of begin to explore, right? I did mention that there's so many variants of APIs. They, they, they have so many formats. Every organization kind of implements it in their own different way, right? Some people use authentication in headers. Some people shove it in the body. Some people do it as a separate call, you know? Imagine the scenario, for example, where, where uh, you're requesting for all the products in the Shopify page and it returns you 5,000 products. Are you going to consume all that? Pagination comes into play. Authentication comes into play. Companies put in call limits as well to ensure that you don't, you don't kill their service. There's a concept called webhooks that's very closely tied to APIs as well. These are all further, a little bit more advanced concepts, which I hope you take the time to kind of dive in and, and, and get to know. But basically, my hope today is to have given you a little bit of uh, that little baseline fundamental wax on, wax off of APIs, right? So thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Reach out to Ria. Yeah. Yes, Jim. Um, how do you integrate back to legacy? Ah. Hmm. So, sorry, I'm not from enterprise, so legacy is not the Does your legacy have any kind of an API? SAP. So, ah. we'll do so. Yeah. So, uh, there's something called middleware, right? <laughs> yeah, so what's it, what's his, what, what he's asking basically is, what if, for example, you've got system A and system B, and system A and B use totally different variants of APIs or total different languages? It might not even have an API, right? How do you integrate legacy systems to new systems? And the only answer I have for that is middleware. Basically, building another system in between that's able to talk to both sides and do the conversion, right? Yeah, it hurts. Uh, we do it in Ninja Van as well where we need to. Uh, but unless you can get out of that legacy systems, there's no real elegant way out of it. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, go ahead. So is it documentation is typically a big pain with APIs? Yes. If you were theoretically a product manager in your organization and you were tasked with making new documentation just the best documentation mm -hmm. out there, mm -hmm. um, what would you kind of focus on? Okay. Very interesting question. Something that I struggle with, not even on the API level. I work some of my product managers here. And it's a conversation that we constantly have. This is a struggle we have as agile practitioners, right? Agile doesn't encourage documentation. So even, <laughs> yeah, is that, is that wrong? This is what I've been taught and schooled, right? Agile doesn't encourage documentation. You do things quick, write high-level statements and go, test and experiment. Similarly, if, and, that, and that basically transposes as a culture into how our devs do their work, right? 
I can tell you even within NinjaVan, we've got varied practices around how well we document our APIs. We've got teams who are much more resolute that will, that will build, um, I'm not sure what they're called, but there are libraries available out there that as you write your code, and basically we're building off microservices, these libraries will listen for the new endpoints and document them as they go. Right? So the hard work of doing all the typing out is it actually taken over by libraries. It's all about finessing the document at the end of it. This is a great, I think it's a great idea because in, in a microservice environment, I'm sure most of us are working on microservices right now, this solves a huge problem. But that discipline to ensure that that library is set up properly and running and uh, updating all this information is, is, is still required on the developer's side. So as a product guy coming into a new company, and if I've been told, let's clean up documentation. The first thing I would do is to understand uh, how bad the situation is, right? APIs have many versions or variants. So you have the legacy variant that Yitch, Yitch brought about. You got the version one, you got the version 1.1, the version 1.1.1, right? And every time you have a new version of an API, you're going to push clients over or people who are integrated into one, into two. But there will be laggards and there will be people who will be left behind. Unfortunately, just as we groom our product backlogs, we've got to be vicious about these things uh, occasionally. So identify what is your company's goal or your company's uh, roadmap for the next two years, for example. Right? Is it to focus all our resources on a particular version of the API? As an example, if our focus is on version 4, then we've got to make a call on whether we need to call the users of version 1 and 2 because we cannot continue to manage an ever-expanding uh, group of APIs. It's extremely difficult. Once you have that understanding of where your focus lies, for example, let's keep people on 3 for another 6 months and then push everyone over to 4, focus all your documentation both on a development level and on a product level on getting it right at least to that degree. There are tools out there to help you these days. I don't know how many of you have heard of um, Apiary. Um, there's also Swagger. Swagger, that's right. That really makes it very easy for us to write documentation in a very structured, simple, organized way. No longer do we need to format confluence pages and stuff like that. It's really about filling up the blanks. Right? Um, Shopify is an anomaly, right? You can go out there and look at APIs of, of products that you use. Not many will reach that level of detail. It's a great example of what we all should be striving to be getting to in terms of API documentation. But we struggle because APIs, just like our products, are living organisms, and they change all the time. And we build APIs in Agile as well, which is anti-documentation. Right? Next question. No more questions? Great. So, so thank you for Rizwan and uh, Bill, as well as uh, Michael, uh, for helping us to record this. Uh, he's from engineers.sg, so if you're looking for the, for the slides and the live stream, it's, it's actually there. Um, and thank you. I, I don't know why you guys are always new. Please come back again. <laughs> Uh, we'll be here to clean up and please talk to us, the speakers will be here. Uh, thank you very much.